Good evening, friends. Uh, I'm back today with the part two of PCOS, everything you need to know. Let's not waste time because um, there are a lot of slides to be discussed and I don't want to go into part three. But uh, having said that, I don't want to rush also. Uh, let's go through as much as possible today. And again, like yesterday, if it abruptly stops, doesn't matter. I will take it uh, part three tomorrow. Um, I'm Murli Tharpai, Dean Sikkim, Manipal of Medical Sciences. I will start with, uh, or rather continue with the controversies in PCOS. Yesterday, these two slides were, uh, I don't know, they were very clear in the end, abruptly got ended. So I am restarting with those slides. Should we estimate gonadotropins? Because we have been traditionally told from our undergraduate days that the FSH-LH ratio is altered in favor of LH. In fact, one is to three. Let's look at the, the relevance of that in today's uh, practice. Gonadotrophins, as you know, PCO can be eugonadotrophic. PCO with regular cycles have hyperandrogenism with normal LH. We have just yesterday seen the phenotypes of different uh, phenotypes of PCO where there can be ovulatory PCO in that LH has to be normal. LH levels have no relationship with insulin levels. So as I said, both metabolic factor and as well as the HPO factor, they sometimes run parallelly uh, without having real connection with each other. Even though I said hyperinsulinemia can give rise to increased LH, that may not happen in most of the cases. So, Higher LH is more evident in lean PCO and is the cause of hyperandrogenism there. So with all these points, estimating FSH LH to know whether the ratio is altered or not is not mandatory. So what's my take? I've also reiterated here, estimation of FSH and LH is not mandatory to diagnose PCOS. You may do it, once you diagnose PCOS by other means, in a case of infertility, you may want to know what is the FSH so that you will realize whether to, uh, uh, you know, adjust how to adjust the dose of FSH. If it is very high, you may cancel the cycle. Similarly, if the LH is very high, again, you may want to uh, wait for a couple of months by either giving OC pills or by giving GnRH agonist. So for that purpose, you may estimate FSH LH but not for diagnosing PCOS. Yesterday, I was very clear to diagnose PCOS. You need to actually estimate the testosterone or maybe DHEAS, or you must have a clinical evidence of hirsutism and then maybe other evidence of hyperandrogenism. Testosterone is definitely, definitely required to diagnose PCOS. Do we need other tests other than FSH, LH, and maybe testosterone or DHEAS? Do we need other tests? Yes, of course. Uh, TSH is the commonest cause of anovulatory cycles. So if you are confused whether it is a pure case of PCOS or there is an overlay of hypothyroidism, it is definitely worthwhile estimating TSH because that's also one of the causes of anovulatory cycles. Similarly, remember I took maybe the third or fourth lecture was on hyperprolactinemia, and it's one of the causes of anovulation. And 3% of women have hyperandrogenism in them. So definitely, definitely prolactin has to be estimated in a case of PCOS. What about AMH? I told you a little bit yesterday that AMH is now being explored as a possible a marker for the PCOS, according to Ishre, but it's not been finalized. It's a marker of disruption of follicular genesis. See, right amount of AMH is always required. Too much of AMH is also not good. Too little of AMH is also not good. So higher in those with amenorrhea rather than oligomenorrhea. So very high AMH means that definitely it's a uh, definitely a case of amenorrhea. Inversely proportional to benefit with weight loss. 
So maybe AMH is being studied properly, its utility in PCOS, probably we must wait for that. Till then, we have to go by these guidelines or Ishray guidelines. As I said, serum AMH levels should not yet be used as alternative for the detection of PCOS morphology. So, or as a single test for diagnosis of PCOS. That's what I said, it is still being explored as a you know, diagnostic tool. Till that time, probably we should not give much importance to estimating AMH. Again, I'm underlying the word to diagnose PCOS. Once you diagnose PCOS, maybe you can estimate AMH to know again, whether it is very high or very low, depending upon that, you may alter your controlled ovarian stimulation. There is emerging evidence that AMH assays will be more accurate in detection of PCOM, that is morphology. What is my take? You may estimate TSH prolactin AMH also. They may guide in the management, hence it may be performed. So in addition to treating PCO with the ovulation inducing drugs, you may have to bring down the TSH level. Usually in infertility, we say it should be less than 2.5. If there is prolactin, we have learned in the prolactin class that even with normal ovulatory cycles, if there is hyperprolactinemia, there can be infertility. So it has to be brought under control. And AMH, I have talked enough. It's not yet alternative for PCOM as I talk today. Maybe next year I may tell something different, depending upon the evidence. What is the clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism? Remember I told you, according to the PCOS society, they say either a clinical or a biochemical evidence of hyperandrogenism. So also Rotterdam criteria, ISRE and ASRM. So what is the clinical evidence of hyperandrogenism? It's not a uh, very secret, acne, hirsutism, alopecia, in other words, male distribution of hair and temporal baldness. In adolescence, it can be severe acne and hirsutism. You can see these pictures. Standardized visual scales are preferred. All of us know that for hirsutism, modified ferryman galway score is done. Levels more than four to six indicate hirsutism. Alopecia, there is something called Ludwig visual score, is preferred for assessing degree and distribution of alopecia. There are ethnic variations to add to our confusion and controversy and dilemma. Caucasian, they have mild phenotype, but they have higher BMIs. Africans, both higher BMI and metabolic features added. Middle Eastern, Hispanic, more severe hirsutism. Southeast Asian increased central adiposity, insulin resistant diabetes mellitus, metabolic risk, and acanthosis nigricans. East Asians, lower BMI and milder hirsutism. So we know we should know all these things, especially tomorrow. Most of you BGs are going to be global doctors. Some of you may go to UK, some of you may go to America. Some of may go to Far East. So you must know these variations. That's why I have brought this slide. What else causes hyperandrogenism also should be very clearly known to us. Not only PCOS causes this. There are other more serious causes of hyperandrogenism and that should not be neglected. That can be more serious. I told you this yesterday also. PCOS is not life-threatening when it is just PCOS. Whereas if there is adrenal hyperplasia, which is giving rise to hyperandrogenism, that is more life-threatening. So let's see, non-classical congenital adrenal hyperplasia. How do you diagnose that? 17 OHP will be more than 800 nanograms per ml. Androgen tumors, testosterone will be more than 150 nanogram per dl so high. Severe insulin resistance syndrome. Obviously, there will be abnormal two-hour OGTT. 
Cushing's cortisol will be less than 1.8 micrograms per dl. Idiopathic hirsutism. How do you know that? There is normal serum androgens. There is raise in probably local androgens. So this differential diagnosis, you must keep in mind always. Otherwise, you will simply treat for PCOS without treating the more serious underlying cause of hyperandrogenism. What are the other dilemmas in diagnosis? Other dilemmas are puberty. I have told you this yesterday, very, very much in detail. Puberty may mimic PCOS as per Rotterdam criteria. I don't want to go into details today because I've told very clearly, you do an ultrasound for any lady, there will be antral follicles all the time. And if a person is not aware of that, he will simply put the diagnosis as polycystic ovary and we will fall for that. 50 to 60% have polycystic pattern without them having PCOS. Irregular cycles till HPO axis matures is not at all uncommon. We know this. Don't expect them to have cycles regularly. Not necessary. Let them enjoy education. Let them enjoy schooling. Let them enjoy college. But of course, they must have one period, one menstrual cycle in three months to avoid hyperplasia of the endometrium. Otherwise, just don't bother. Most of the time, I tell the young girls, adolescents, and their mothers also that if they have once in three cycles, just don't bother them. Don't discuss this with anybody. I tell the girls, don't discuss with your classmates. Don't discuss with your relatives. Don't discuss in Mahila Samaj. Don't discuss anywhere. It is unnecessary stress for the girl. But if they don't have once in three months, then of course we need to give some withdrawal ready. That's all that is required. So we must keep this in mind. At the menopausal transition also, we know that because of oligoovulation, because the eggs are depleting, there will be periods of amenorrhea. Nothing to worry. There is period of androgen excess also. I remember very well my uh, you know, uh, grandmother used to have some uh, androgenic uh, distribution of hair. So that is not uncommon at all. As I said, irregular cycle is almost a norm in the menopausal transition. So recent thoughts on use of ultrasound in this category. Ultrasound should not be used to diagnose PCOS up to eight years after menarche. Usually nowadays they have attained menarche around you know, 11 to 12 years and all that. Then up to 16, 17, 18, you know, this is the very crucial period in a girl's time. There's a change of school, change of environment, and there is a lot of stress, especially to go for a professional college. All these things will work on them through the hypothalamus and some amount of irregular cycles, some amount of amenorrhea is not at all uncommon. Not everybody is PCOS. That's why I want to highlight. If you send them for an ultrasound analysis, they will see some follicles and they will say it is polycystic ovary. And they are healthy looking on the plumper side, overweight side. You will put two things together and say she is having PCOS, which is not true. So that's why they have now very clearly said, Ishray, 2000, June 2019, don't do ultrasound up to eight years after menarche. Let them just enjoy their adolescence. Let them just be like that. If at all you want to do, it is better we do TVS. Of course, the caveat is if they are sexually active. Otherwise, you have no right to put a TVS probe in a young girl who is especially unmarried. The threshold they have defined, if at all you want to say that there are polycystic uh, you know, follicles, they should be around that primordial follicle type, not just antral follicle type, which are less than 10 millimeters. They should be at least something like 12 to 14 millimeters, and they should be more than 20 in number in either of the ovaries and or, or. If you go by the size of either ovary, it should be more than 10 ml. So very clearly defined now by Ishray. I hope this slide is going to be very useful for us to determine what to do and what not to do.
In postmenopausal, is there a possibility of PCOS? Postmenopausal persistence of PCOS could be considered likely with continuing evidence of hyperandrogenism. That's what I was just telling you a couple of minutes ago. My old granny, she had hair, you know, and we all used to, uh, you know, make fun of her. Now I feel bad for doing that. We were kids, of course. We didn't understand PCOS could be there in a postmenopausal lady. We used to make fun of her. She had her own issues, probably. So there is hyperandrogenism, and that can give rise to hair. And plus, she had white hair also, which must be so embarrassing to her. Maybe she didn't know how to shave it also. Especially if there is past diagnosis of PCOS during reproductive years. So it will not leave you even if you attain menopause. Because it's not just the ova. It is some hyperandrogenism in them, maybe coming from adrenals, maybe coming from elsewhere. But there is hyperandrogenism. That's why from yesterday evening, 7.30, I'm harping on one word, hyperandrogenism, hyperandrogenism, and hyperandrogenism. So what's my take? Exercise caution while branding pubertal girls and those in menopausal transition as PCOS. It can be very, very dangerous. It has got far-reaching effects on their mental status. They will go for depression. Dilemmas in treatment strategies. Now, we have understood so much about PCOS and all that. Patient is not worried. She says, the theory is for you. Give me the treatment. So what do you do? The dilemmas there, what to base our treatment on? There are two strategies. One is complaint-based or concern-based. As I said, PCOS is not one single disease. It is the manifestation of many underlying problems. Also, the manifestations are different. So, we, patient says, I don't know. I am having this problem. You treat me this problem right now. And we know PCOS can be there from adolescent to postmenopausal lady. Adolescent lady is not, the girl is not bothered about infertility. So, don't talk about infertility to her. At the same time, a old lady is not worried about fertility also again. And she's not worried about, let's say, acne and other things. Her worries are different. She's worried about uh, developing endometrial cancer. She's worried about developing type 2 diabetes and all those things. So you keep the theory with yourself. You treat the patient's concern. That is the meaning of complaint-based or concern-based treatment. Treat the complaint. Treating multiple complaints simultaneously, of course, is a challenge. She has got acne, she has got hirsutism, she has got uh, irregular cycles. Can you treat all the three with a single drug? Let us see. Then the other thing is me or us telling Murli sir has taken a good class. We have understood the pathophysiology. Irrespective of the patient's complaint, I will treat the pathophysiology. That is another view. Wherein you say, I know PCOS is metabolic disorder, so I will advise lifestyle changes or metformin. Or you may say, I know it is a reproductive disorder, so I will give COCs, antiandrogens, and ovulation induction. But I personally feel this is not a correct attitude. This is fine. We have to understand pathophysiology, but we cannot treat, treat the patient based on pathophysiology. As I said, every patient will not have everything. One patient's concern may be only obesity. If you just give her prescription for how to reduce the weight, her problem is solved. Automatically, PCO also will be solved. Another girl's concern is only hirsutism, nothing else. We have seen such varieties. Another person's worry is only acne. Whereas the moment she gets married, she says acne is all right. Her sadism is also all right. By this time, she has understood how to tackle them. But now she wants a child. Her problem is infertility. Treat me for that. Later in life, she says, I have completed family. Luckily, somehow somebody nicely induced my ovulation. Now I am worried whether I'll get diabetes, whether I'll get hypertension, whether I'll get other problems, hyperlipidemia, cancer cervix, or I mean, rather cancer endometrium. So we have to 
tailor the treatment according to patient's request, according to patient's concern, according to patient's complaint. Not because we have understood something and we will treat that. I hope I am clear in this. Prioritize the concern or need and treat accordingly. Optimize the combination of drugs. For example, in infertility, you may want to give clomiphene citrate with metformin or letrozole with metformin, things like that. So I will now change my style of slides. All this while I was talking about controversies wherein first slide said their controversy, second slide explanation, third slide gave my take. Now onwards, there's a slight change in my style of presentation. I will concentrate only on the concern-centered management. This is ultimately what is important for us, having understood everything about uh, PCOS. So what are the concerns? There are so many concerns. I already spelled out many times, but I can group them as three main categories. What are the three main categories? One is those due to annulation. Obviously, menstrual irregularity is number one. Fibroid uterus, because annulation means what? Unopposed estrogenic action. So there will be fibroid. Endometriosis also can be there. They can coexist with PCOS. Infertility, obviously, because of annulation. And endometrial or ovarian cancer. Again, it is because of unopposed estrogenic action. The second category is because of androgen excess. All of us know they are hirsutism, main problem, scalp hair loss, that is alopecia or male type of balding, acne, and depression. Obviously, if you have this kind of a hair distribution and acne, you will go into depression. Even otherwise, people go into depression. If they slightly don't look like uh, the most beautiful in the vicinity. Then the other main concern, once you age, is metabolic dysfunction. And that consists of obesity. Of course, obesity is across the age group. Sleep apnea, you want to sleep. Sleep becomes a very, you know, premier commodity. You don't realize that. You realize about sleep only later in life. NASH, non-alcoholic statoria of the hepatitis. Hyperlipidemia, which can give rise to its own problems, cardiac events and all sorts of things. Type 2 diabetes. You know, you don't have too many diseases. You just have diabetes. You have everything in life. That is enough to destroy uh, you know, so many organs and so many problems. CV events, finally. So these are the three, three main categories or three main boxes of problems, and we will see that. So these are the main problems, say, probably in the adolescence, what I have encircled, and probably others belong to the later age group. What are the goals of treatment? Based on those, number one goal is management of irregular cycles. This is across adolescence and adulthood till they attain menopause, or even sometimes after menopause, they can have stray cycles. Amelioration of hyperandrogenic features, hirsutism, acne, balding, such things. Ovulation induction for those you know, pursuing pregnancy or chasing pregnancy, infertility. That is the next goal. Contraception for those not pursuing pregnancy. They have somehow had one or two kids. Now their concern is, I don't know when I'm going to have cycles. I don't know whether, how to use contraceptives properly. I don't want any more children. So that is the next concern. Management of underlying metabolic abnormalities. As you age, that is a big concern. Then prevention of endometrial hyperplasia and carcinoma. That is towards menopause or post-menopause. So as I said, the first two are mainly in the adolescent girls or in young age. The next two are in the middle age, that is reproductive years. And the last two are for elderly or later years. So let us take up one by one. The first one is management of irregular cycles. 
Already I have given some broad hints and clue as to how to manage the irregular cycles. The most important thing is to nicely educate the mother first of an adolescent girl and of course all the ladies that you don't have to menstruate 12 times in a year. Of course, that is probably we are used to thinking that it is normal. Yes, it is not bad. It's not uh, abnormal, but it is not mandatory. What is mandatory is that you must have at least one cycle in three months. So that is mandatory. So if she is if she's unmarried, now I'm using the terminology single or not in relationship because when I gave this lecture in the King's College London, they all started laughing. They say we don't categorize women as married and unmarried in UK, in the West in general, because it has got sort of probably no meaning. What they want us to tell is if she's you know, single or not in a relationship or not worried about fertility, that is the meaning. So we call it as unmarried girls here, okay? So that's a clarification. If she is less than 35 years and her BMI is less than 30, go ahead and give COC pills if she insists that I must have 12 cycles in a year. Okay, take it. You have to take every day one tablet, 21 days on, seven days off, all the best. But if she's convinced that I don't have to have 12 cycles, just having once in three months is good enough, then you give her just progesterone withdrawal once in two or three months. That's all that's required. In fact, in last few years, I have somehow spent 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes with the girls as well as their mothers and convince them they need not have. So I'm not giving them OC pills at all because OC pills somehow, they are really worried and they'll get, to, you know, they have got other concerns. So I'm just giving them withdrawal once in three months. That's good enough. If they are more than 35 years, definitely, definitely, no doubt in my mind that COC pills are better avoided. Of course, in, when I talk about COC pills in another lecture, I may say up to 40 years, sometimes you can give. Some textbooks say that. And some articles say that. But I would not venture to give this after 35 years. So better, again, for them would be to give progesterone withdrawal once in two to three months, or better still would be, see, if you are worried about conceiving, if you say that I don't know when I'm going to ovulate, so... Uh, I have already two children and I want contraception, then the best is LNG IUS. That will, you know, go, uh, push them into total amenorrhea and that's better. So this is the simple thing to manage the irregular cycles. If they are married on the other hand, married in the sense they have got uh, sexual activity and they are wanting children, anxious to conceive, you straight away go for induction of ovulation. Don't waste your time at all. So that's what I talk very clearly in when I talk in infertility lectures, then there's no point. See, there is another myth that is uh, in the in many, many women is that somewhere they would have read regular cycles means ovulation, irregular cycle means uh, there is no ovulation. So they don't understand that irregular cycle is because of anovulation. They think other way around. What they say, doctor, you do one thing, you regularize my cycle, I will be okay. How to regularize the cycle? They say, okay, OC pills, if I take regularly, I will ovulate regularly. But they don't understand that when you take OC pills, you have an ovulation. So if you have an ovulation, you will only get artificial menses once in correctly a month when you take OC pills, but that will not give you ovulation. So we have to again spend another 20 minutes or 40 minutes to say that regularization of cycle is not important. Getting egg is important if you want to consider. I hope we will do all that. We have to spend enough time with the patients to talk to them. They have genuine concern. They have not understood. Don't ridicule them. Tell them clearly. But if they are not concerned with the 
fertility. They have already have got two children. They are now worried only about amenorrhea. You can give the same as above as unmarried. That is, if they are less than 35 years, and if they are insisting on 12 cycles, give them OC pills. If they are not insisting, then give them progesterone withdrawals and LNG OES for contraception. I hope this is very, very clear. Though it is one slide, I have spent a lot of time to explain this. Looks like I'm going into the third part three tomorrow. It doesn't matter. I don't want to hurry up. There are lots of things I have to talk about the different treatment aspects. What is the recent thoughts? Which COC pills to be given? This became a big controversy in Ishre 2018 guidelines. They have written one sentence, don't give ciprotinacetate. Many people thought that you should never give ciprotinacetate at all. What they meant was that the 35 MCG ethanol estradiol plus ciprotinacetate preparation should not be considered as first line. That word was missed by many people. They never said don't give at all. If there is hyperandrogenism, ciprotinacetate is not bad at all. It, it's, it has worked very well. But don't use it as first line in PCOS as per general population guidelines. Due to adverse effects, including venous thrombotic risk. Yes, ciprotinacetate has, has got venous thrombotic risk, much more compared to the other progesterone. Ethinyl estradiol is itself having a lot of uh, actually thromboembolic. Estrogen is worse than progesterone in, in, in terms of thromboembolic risk. So why blame simply ciprotinacetate? Various COC pills preparations have similar efficacy in treating hirsutism. What they meant was, if you can manage hirsutism with other COC pills, don't give COC pill containing ciprotinacetate. But in your particular patient, if the other OC preparations have not worked, you can give ciprotinacetate after making sure that she doesn't have history of thromboembolic phenomena, she doesn't have any family history and things like that. So I hope I have read it correctly and I'm telling you also what I uh, interpreted it as. They have never said anywhere, there are much more things, but I've just extracted this much part. They have never said anywhere, don't give it at all. It's totally contraindicated, they have never said. They have just said, don't consider it as the first line in PCOS, that's all. COC pills with metformin may be most beneficial in high metabolic risk groups. So you give COC pills and if they have metabolic risk groups, including those with diabetic risk factors, impaired glucose tolerance or high risk ethnic groups. So I think I will uh, take this. Let's see if we can finish this amelioration of hyperandrogenic features. So what is that? Hirsutism. Now hirsutism, again, I need to clarify I did a, a study, in fact, I gave this as a thesis to uh, one of my students, Dr. Deepak Goenka. He's one of the very, very flourishing infertility specialists in Assam. He was my thesis student and he did this study on hirsutism. That's the topic I gave him. And uh, we have then understood very clearly, if the hair is already grown, no matter how much of drug you give, how many kgs of tablets you give, it will not go away. The established hair has to be removed mechanically, either by waxing, threading, or epilation, and men have understood it clearly, shaving. But I know girls, young girls and women would not like to use the shaving of especially the, the face uh, because they somehow feel that you know it will go oh, faster and things like that. But it is not really so. Anyway, uh, shaving part, I... Uh, we don't want to stress, but definitely waxing 30. Better still would be electrolysis and laser. Permanently you get rid of the hair. What is the use of pharmacological agent then? COC containing separatism, of course, that's the not first line. Antiandrogens, flutamide. Dr. Uh, Deepak Goenka did the study on flutamide. We used uh, 150 milligrams of flutamide for six months. But the problem is these pharmacological agents will not remove the hair they will slow down the growth of next batch of hair and they will make the terminal hair into the soft hair so that it becomes easier to remove. And when you stop the trick after six months, they will come back with vengeance. And not only that, all these antiandrogens have got very bad liver effects. So we did LFT zero after three months and after six months for the study. And we found that it's not really going to get rid of hair totally. But 
it can slow down the growth of hair. Metformin reduces androgens, but it is not first and drug for hirsutism. My take is after that big study that we did way, very long back, we did this study for established hair mechanical methods, nothing short of that. Take it from me. To soften and to slow down the regrowth of hair, you may use pharmacological methods, maybe OCPs containing cyprotin acetate, or you can give flutamide or whatever it is, penestrate also. But uh, you should be very careful because they will have side effects. They will have liver problems and things like that. So it is better to convince the girls that uh, you know, you have to have a method of going for a permanent removal of hair like electrolysis or laser. So I think I'll stop here uh, and um, probably I will continue with the rest of the treatment. I don't want to really hurry up uh, uh, and try to finish. It's the time is ending. Um, we shall meet tomorrow again, the same time, 7.30. Thank you very much.